The words, this land is your land, this land is my land, could not ring truer than when talking about the 20 national grasslands that comprise nearly 4 million acres of publicly owned land. They are wonderfully unique lands that are used for a variety of purposes, including recreation, cattle grazing, oil, gas, and mineral exploration. These lands serve as habitat for threatened and endangered species and as windows to our recent and distant past. These lands are managed by the United States Forest Service and are intermingled with other federal, state, and privately owned parcels in North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, Wyoming, Colorado, Kansas, Oklahoma, New Mexico, Texas, Idaho, Oregon, and California. Each grassland has an identity all its own, but all share a rich history which ties them together. As you can see, the majority of the grasslands are located in the Great Plains. This area was, and still remains, traditional homelands to a large number of different tribes, each with their own distinct protocols, customs, and language. The grasslands provided Plains tribes like the Sioux Nation, Kiowa, Crow, Arapaho, Pawnee, Arikara, Cheyenne, and Comanche with an abundance of resources to lead a satisfying, perhaps even envied existence. The bountiful grasslands provided for the bison and other game. Many tribes hunted bison and integrated the animal with their spiritual life as it was responsible for their existence in the grasslands. Complex and rich tribal societies existed for thousands of years living in this grasslands environment. However, by the end of the 1870s, the culmination of wars and battles with the United States government, broken treaties and political warfare, non-indigenous diseases, reservation life, and the expansion of non-Indians seeking wealth and fortune in the New West saw the end of this comfortable and treasured lifestyle. Late in the 19th century, another group of individuals started making its way west to the Great Plains as well. These people were taking advantage of the Homestead Act of 1862, which provided land to individuals as long as they agreed to live and work on it and make certain improvements. The first homesteaders located along the river drainages where there was an abundance of water, shelter, and wood. But as these areas quickly filled up, Later arrivals were forced to claim areas that were considered sub-marginal, at best, for farming. These new settlers, known as sodbusters, attempted to farm the land and raise cultivated crops rather than livestock. The cattlemen, sheepmen, and sodbusters had all come to the area for the same reason. However, those who raised livestock for a living were soon engaged in range wars with the farmers over control of the land. And if fighting with neighbors wasn't enough, Mother Nature wasn't very cooperative either. Most homesteaders had little experience in farming, and those who had were used to the moist growing conditions back east and in Europe. The Great Plains presented a totally different picture. The rainfall was barely half as much as these new settlers were used to. The winds blew often, winters were bitterly cold, and shelter was limited. Despite these adverse conditions, some homesteaders were able to make a go of it and produce bountiful crops. However, that all started to change drastically by the end of World War I. The demand for agricultural products began to decline because of the farm price collapse in 1919 and 1920. This, along with the great distances needed to travel to market, made it very difficult for farming to be a profitable way of life. The already harsh weather conditions also started to worsen. During the mid-1920s, rainfall decreased drastically. Crops shriveled in the heat and the land became barren as the persistent winds damaged and eroded away the topsoil. Thus began the Dust Bowl era, a decade punctuated by massive clouds of topsoil sweeping across the Great Plains. 
Combined with the financial hardship created by the Great Depression, this forced hundreds of thousands away from their homes. As news of this grave situation made its way back east to the nation's capital, plans were formulated to reclaim this wind-ravaged land and help those who had once made it their home. That help came in the form of the National Industrial Recovery Act of 1933 and the Emergency Relief Appropriations Act of 1935. These acts allowed the federal government to purchase damaged and abandoned land for an average of $4.40 per acre. As a result, many of the families who had come upon hard times were relocated and work began to restore the abandoned land. Much of the land was planted with non-native species of vegetation in order to try and stop the soil loss. These government purchase lands, or land utilization projects, were designed to encourage appropriate land use by creating a balance between rural economic needs and the natural resources. In 1937, the Bankhead Jones Farm Tenant Act gave custody of these lands to the Secretary of Agriculture and gave the authority to move forward with more extensive conservation efforts under administration by the Soil Conservation Service. Between 1933 and 1943, approximately 11 million acres of land that had been devastated by drought conditions were purchased. Nearly 24,000 families were relocated. During those 10 years, hundreds of thousands of acres were reclaimed, shelter belts were planted, and erosion control measures undertaken. Civilian Conservation Corps and Work Project Administration members were responsible for many of the improvements. Homesteaders who managed to survive some of the darkest days in the early part of the 20th century formed grazing associations to help develop and administer conservation practices. By 1945, the lands that once held such a bright future for the homesteaders were once again supporting soil-stabilizing grasses. By the mid-1950s, as part of the Department of Agriculture's reorganization, administration of the land utilization projects was shifted from the Soil Conservation Service to other natural resource management agencies. Some were transferred to the National Park Service and the Fish and Wildlife Service. Others in some western states were transferred to the Bureau of Land Management. The remaining land utilizations were transferred to the Forest Service. Then, on June 23, 1960, the National Grasslands came into existence. There were nearly four million acres of land utilization projects located primarily in the Great Plains region. They were managed by the Forest Service as part of the National Forest System. These 20 parcels of land served as demonstration areas showing how lands classified as unsuitable for cultivation could be managed for forage, wildlife habitat, prairie woodlands, energy and minerals, as well as water and outdoor recreation to benefit both the land and people. On April 1, 1961, the 19 original national grasslands received their official names. Comanche, Pawnee, Curlew, Cimarron, Kiowa, Cedar River, Little Missouri, Cheyenne, Black Kettle, Rita Blanca, Crooked River, Buffalo Gap, Fort Pier, Grand River, Caddo, Lyndon B. Johnson, McClellan Creek, Thunder Basin. In the mid-1990s, Butte Valley National Grassland was also added to the list. Since 1954, it has been the job of the Forest Service to manage the multiple uses that now take place on these national treasures. Economically, these grasslands are very beneficial to local communities and the nation as a whole. Livestock grazing is probably the most widely known use and one that cannot be overlooked. 
This use is important to many of the nearby rural communities because of their agricultural programs and lifestyles. Over one million head months of livestock are grazed annually on our national grasslands. In addition, some of the grasslands have abundant mineral resources such as oil, gas, and coal. Over one million acres of national grasslands are leased for minerals and have over 1,800 producing oil wells. The Thunder Basin National Grassland in Wyoming has five producing coal mines, including the nation's largest. The receipts from oil, gas, coal, and grazing from the 20 national grasslands exceed a quarter of a billion dollars annually. This is quite significant economically, both locally and nationally. However, these parcels of public land in states that have very little public land generate considerable revenues from the variety of recreational opportunities that are available. Many of the grasslands offer hunting, fishing, terrain for rock hounding, beautiful birding habitats, camping, boating, and mile upon mile of hiking and biking opportunities. Annually, these attractions account for over one million recreation visitor days. These same visitors spend money in the neighboring rural communities which are often struggling economically. As more and more people use the national grasslands for their abundance of recreational activities, they are learning about the grasslands' biological diversity. Seventeen of the twenty national grasslands lie within the Great Plains, which is the nation's largest ecosystem. These grasslands are remnants of the native grassland vegetation that evolved in these areas. Changes in the grassland ecosystem have been many. Much of the area originally in native grass has been converted to agricultural crops. This, combined with flood control and irrigation projects, has reduced or altered many natural habitats. As a result, the grasslands are very important to the maintenance and recovery of plants that are at risk in the Great Plains. Some of these plants are endangered and include the western prairie fringed orchid, blowout penstemon, and the ute lady's tresses. These lands also serve as home to many game and non-game animals, threatened and endangered species, and breeding birds. There are currently 13 species that are listed as threatened or endangered and over 60 others considered global species of concern because of the declines in habitats. These include native grass, wetlands, and changes in riverine communities. The black-tailed prairie dog is a perfect example. Prairie dogs are one of the few species that not only live in a habitat, but they create one. The prairie dog is key to the survival of numerous other species including black-footed ferrets. However, prairie dog populations have been reduced to less than 2% of their historic range. Most of the prairie dog's existing habitat is now located on small, isolated parcels of the national grasslands located in the Great Plains. The black-footed ferret is the most endangered mammal in North America and has been reintroduced into the Buffalo Gap National Grassland in South Dakota. Black-footed ferrets rely on prairie dogs for their food and shelter. The Forest Service is working with four other federal agencies in an attempt to help this species thrive once again. Many black-footed ferret litters have been born in the wild since the first reintroduction in South Dakota in 1994. The national grasslands of the Great Plains also serve as habitat for 330 of the 435 bird species that breed in the United States. However, many of those species are in decline due to habitat loss and habitat changes. These lands of the Great Plains also serve as home to most of the butterflies that are on the threatened and endangered species list, such as the regal fritillary and the Dakota skipper. The Forest Service is committed to ensuring the sustainability of these native species by managing national grasslands to ensure their viability and productivity. Noxious weeds and non-native vegetation pose threats to our native grassland ecosystems. The Forest Service is implementing an aggressive, integrated pest management program to control and reduce noxious weed infestations. 
they are focusing revegetation efforts of disturbed grassland areas using native grassland species. The Forest Service is interested in reintroduction of natural disturbance processes, such as fire, in the grassland ecosystem. Prescribed fire is being reintroduced on national grasslands to accomplish a variety of objectives which include helping with the conversion to native grassland species, improving habitat conditions, increasing nutrient recycling, and reducing noxious weed infestations. We see that the national grasslands play an enormous role in the Great Plains ecosystem, but these lands are also unparalleled from a historical perspective as well. Many of the artifacts found on the grasslands of the Great Plains provide a glimpse into our storied past. A past that includes prehistoric Indian use, westward expansion, the homesteading era, and one of the largest environmental restoration projects in history. Great Plains geology is mountain building processes. Volcanic ash and wind and waterborne sediments created by violent geological events, mainly to the west, were deposited in the continent's midsection. Environmental change brought on by these events produced many now extinct plants and animals. Fossil resources can be found on many of the national grasslands in the Great Plains dating from 10,000 years ago all the way to 130 million years ago when they were under a large inland sea. There are 150 million year old dinosaur trackways on the Comanche National Grassland in southeast Colorado. There are mammal fossils and trackways from several past eras on the Pawnee, Oglala and Buffalo Gap National Grasslands. And then there are marine fossils such as mosasaurs, shark's teeth, and shellfish that inhabited the Cretaceous Sea from 65 to 90 million years ago. But what makes these areas so unique from a historical perspective is the mix and abundance of heritage resources. Artifacts of the homesteading era are mixed in with earlier prehistoric resources. Old home sites have nearly all been obliterated. In addition, there are a significant number of other historic and prehistoric sites with artifacts indicating nearly continuous Ocelio Indian era. They range anywhere in age from 200 years to 10,000 years. This includes the largest concentration of bones from an extinct bison species in the Western Hemisphere. At least 600 bison were killed in an arroyo located in the Oglala National Grassland in Nebraska. Stone artifacts that have been found near the bones have been identified with the ancient Alberta culture that existed in the United States from 8 to 10,000 years ago. Understanding grassland values is a challenge that lies ahead not only for the Forest Service, but for everyone. And the key to that understanding is education. Education within the Forest Service, making more information available to the general public and working with ranchers and others in order to help the public better appreciate the delicate balance that has to be maintained in order for these grasslands to be sustained. The Forest Service is doing this in many ways. The National Grasslands Visitor Center was created in Wall, South Dakota. The center is a source for better understanding the beauty and uses of America's undiscovered public lands. This interpretive center focuses on providing national grasslands information and interpreting their special history, resources, attractions, and management. A good portion of the center is devoted to young children and builds an appreciation for public lands at a very early age. The center also serves as a reminder to the local population that the land they live and work on is nationally as well as regionally significant. Ongoing Forest Service research is helping us to better understand the complex interrelationships between the use of resources and the sustainability of our grassland ecosystems. The Forest Service is committed to working with agency and university scientists to understand the impacts of various management regimes on soils, watersheds, habitats, livestock operations, and species viability. 
This research is helping to develop a better understanding of what it takes to maintain a harmonious coexistence between sustainable ecosystems and rural communities. The old attitude of us versus them is slowly eroding as those whose livelihoods depend on the grasslands are now understanding that these areas serve multiple purposes. People are realizing that it's up to them and others to ensure that all values are protected for future generations. Thus, the ongoing challenge for the Forest Service is to promote the sustainability of ecosystems within the grasslands, ensuring their health, diversity, and productivity. It's the goal of the Forest Service to devote itself to gaining more partnership support and volunteer involvement in grassland management through constituencies and organizations such as bird watchers, mountain bikers, ranchers, the Nature Conservancy, Ducks Unlimited, our grazing permittees and associations, and many others. Volunteers and partnering organizations have been involved in grassland projects such as the black-footed ferret reintroduction, habitat monitoring, archaeological survey and digs, breeding bird surveys, recreation and trail projects, and developing wetlands for fishing and waterfowl production. Volunteers and partners also serve as vital links to the general public. That's because they love the prairie and want to act as its ambassadors for continued conservation and multiple use. The Forest Service could not provide for many of these opportunities without the support of these partners. The job of public education about national grasslands management is tough because the national grasslands are easily overlooked. For the most part, they are generally not viewed by many as scenic or exciting as the huge peaks and alpine meadows that are found throughout typical national forest land. However, they are not without some of the most beautiful country and incredible vistas that can be found anywhere in the United States. So, if people can get out on these lands, spend some time there, and see their beauty and all the things that are happening, they will truly gain an appreciation for the specialness and uniqueness of each area. The future of the national grasslands is an exciting one. The Forest Service is committed in its effort to maintain a variety of multiple uses, such as grazing, recreation, wildlife habitat, and mineral development. It's the belief of the Forest Service that this commitment, along with ongoing conservation efforts, will preserve healthy and vital grassland ecosystems that are sustained for the enjoyment of future generations. For more information about the National Grasslands, you can call or write the National Grasslands Visitor Center, or there's a wealth of information at the National Grasslands website.